seated. Let's be seated. Praise the Lord. I want to give glory and honor to God for this wonderful day. Um, the word of God says, so many years ago as a young Christian, I read the scripture in Ecclesiastes that says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. As a young Christian, I didn't understand it. Because I think the day of death is supposed to be a day of sorrow. But um, later on when I started growing my Christian faith, I asked God, why that scripture? What is the meaning? And in what way is the day of death? For what purpose is the day of death better than the day of birth? And among other things that he said to me, he said, you know when a child is born, the child is crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody is rejoicing. Wow, wow. He's a boy, he's a girl, and all that. And uh, that child grows, goes through life, you know, goes to school, get educated, give their life to Christ, start starving. And then the day comes, how many years that they die as old and mature people who have left their footprint on the sands of time. And then when they die, everybody now begins to cry. And then they begin to laugh. And then among other things, you know, in Bible days and in church history and theological, you know, education, you will see that birthdays are not given much emphasis as, as such. Birthdays in the Bible were days of tragedy. If you look at it closely, you know, and uh, Christmas, we celebrate it, but actually the real thing that we need to celebrate as Christians is not Christmas. What we need to celebrate more is Easter. Because there is no way we can be Christians and live in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. If all we had was Christmas, he came, Jesus came to die. He's been born in as much as we are grateful and glad. We derive so much more from his death. That was how he got saved. He didn't get saved because he was born. He got saved because he died. Uh, when I remember, I look at it, I say, he came to die. I say, he came to die? Uh, no, no one would hear, will agree that if they are describing, they say, he came to die. No, you came to live. Is that not? <laughs> everybody wants to go to heaven, but everybody is afraid of death. In fact, the Bible calls death an enemy. First Corinthians 15, 26. Say the last enemy that we defeated is death. So if there is a day to celebrate, to be happy, to be joyful and feel fulfilled, I believe it's um, this season of the year. You find Easter as a word in the Bible, but you don't find Christmas as a word in the Bible. You discover in Acts 12, the intention was to bring up Peter after Easter and then to have him killed. But before the, that could happen, he escaped. So Easter was his escape. When they were waiting to celebrate his killing him and all that, it never happened. So when you get home today, I want you to sit down before God and your family and friends and just give glory to God that Jesus came to die for us. He died that we, so that we can live. To make us righteous, he was made sin. He became sick to make us well. He suffered shame to give us glory. He went to hell to take us to heaven. Uh, so whatever you and I have today is because of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that is why the subject I'm going to share today is a message, a burden that God gave me. I have learned quite a number of things from Christ. But let me say this to you. This is one of the most important and the first lessons that I learned as a Christian. I, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and John is 89 chapters. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 89 chapters. And I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John every month. Because if you read three chapters every day, you read through the 89 chapters every month. I did it for 12 years. I learned so many things. But I want you to know that the first thing that struck me and which today has affected me in the way I carry myself, in the way I go about life, is this lesson I want to share with you. 
And I know he is a great tool in the hand of any church. He's a great tool in the hand of any person. He's a great tool in the hand of any family. He's a great tool that will cause many things to happen for you for good. If only you inculcate, internalize, and begin to display them. So let's open our Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Ask your neighbor, can you give me a verse from the book of Luke? Give him or her a verse, just from the whole book of Luke. Quickly, quickly, give your neighbor a verse from the book of Luke. Did you get something from there? Did he give you? How many of you are giving? Okay, at least that is Luke 10, 19. Uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> even if you don't know many. Okay, Luke's Gospel 10, I read from verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit, to inherit eternal life? He said unto them, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, these were religious people. When he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went into him and bound his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and... Give them to the host and say unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendeth more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Verse 36, which now of these three, take care thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves. And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do Likewise, by the grace of God, I'll be speaking on the subject, learning from Christ. We want to learn something from Christ. We want to learn from Christ's example. When he came to this world, why he came, we want to learn something from God. When he sent his only begotten son, why did he send that only begotten son? For whom did he send that begotten son? want to learn from Christ. Let us pray. Father, we give you glory and praise as we celebrate the death, the burial, the resurrection, and ascension of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us so much. Despite who we were and who we have been, thank you for still loving us freely. Father, we open our heart tonight, this morning, afternoon, that you speak to us, well, for we, your servant, heareth. Thank you for educating us, informing us, instructing us, and enlightening us in this very important area of the example and what Christ came to this world to mirror. Father, at the end of the day, what we desire is that we internalize this principle and begin to practice it in a way like never before, as individuals and as a church and as families here represented. Thank you for anointing me to share this word the way you've revealed it to me. And let your name be glorified. And let it be at the end of the day that no one will be punished because of this word they are receiving. Because your word says, if they have not come and spoken unto them, they have no sin. But rather, now that I have spoken unto them, if they do not carry it out, their sin will remain. Help us that this word will not be the base of our condemnation, but the base of our justification. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Learning from Christ. As a believer, generally, I know that most of us do not have a problem as to how we should treat God or as to how we should relate to God. Most Christians don't have any problem as to how they treat God or how they relate to God. The word treats, how you treat God, means how you act or behave towards somebody. So we don't have problems as believers. How do we treat God? I mean, the word treat also means how you deal with somebody. I mean, we don't have problems as to how to deal with him, deal with God. The word deal, I mean, treat also means how we regard or handle our connection and our relationship to God. Anyone who says they are, they are Christians, usually we do not have a problem about that. And this is because... A lot is said in the word of God as to how we should treat God. For example, we are told that we should love God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. I mean, I mean Matthew 22, 37 rather. Deuteronomy 6 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. With all thy soul. With all thy might. Second Thessalonians 3 5 says, May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God. So we don't have a problem. Oh yeah. With which, I mean, nobody contend or discuss or challenge that. That one way to treat God is to love him. Nobody will challenge that. Um, another way we need to treat God is to honor him. I mean, in this church, I mean, you honor the Lord, not just with mouth and tongue, but also in deed and truth. And the word of God has a lot to say about that. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. And we are reminded in Romans 13, verse 7, that we, we should give honor to whom honor is due. So nobody has a problem. A Christian does not have a problem with that. Nobody has a problem with the fact that we need to serve, uh, fear God. I mean, the Bible said in Psalm 34, verse 11, come, let me teach you the fear of God. Ecclesiastes 12, 15, 13, the wisest man that ever lives, let us hear the conclusion of this matter. To fear God and to keep his commandment, that is the only duty of man. Psalm 19, verse 9 says, the fear of God is pure. Enduring forever. So nobody, Christians, we don't have a problem with how to relate to God, how to treat him, how to regard him. We don't have a problem with knowing that we ought not to be far from God, of course. I mean, we don't, we don't, nobody wants to be far from God. Psalm 22, verse 11. Say, be not far from me, O God, for trouble is near. Ephesians 2, 13 says, those who are far have been made near by the blood. Jeremiah 23, 23 says, am I a God that is far? Oh my God, that is near. We know that we need to do that. That is the proper way we need to relate to God. We also know that we ought to give him thanks. Uh, we cannot afford to be ingrates. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 18, in everything give thanks. Psalm 92, verse 1 said, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy. Said, I mean, uh, 92, verse 1 said, It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness all through the day. So, as Christians, we don't have a problem with that. We don't have a problem with the fact that we need to serve him. Even for those who are not, who are not workers, you don't have a problem with doing that. Yes, I ought to serve. And so when you are confronted with the fact that you are not serving, you know, you, you try to give some explanations, knowing that that's the proper and the right thing to do. You know that we need to serve God. In fact, the Bible tells us that's one of the reasons why we are saved. That's one of the reasons why we are made. That's one of the reasons why we are delivered. Luke chapter 1, verse 74, 75 says that we've been delivered from our enemies. We may serve him in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. And then as Christians, we also know that we don't have a problem with the fact that we need to follow him. Now, all of these are aspects of how we need to treat God and how we ought to relate to God. So there are other, I mean, we need to fellowship with him. We need to pray and all of that, so we don't have a problem with that. However, God's word does not only tell us as to how we ought to treat God, but God's word has a lot to say about how we ought to treat other people. That is a very important thing. You see, because most of the time, Christians, we, we say a lot and we try to, a lot to emphasize how we treat God. I mean, I try not to be sinful. I try to pray. I try to talk to God in prayer. 
I honor God, I love God, I give and so on. But you see, many, many times, we do not understand that the same word that tells us how we ought to treat God also has a lot to say about how we ought to treat other human beings. Because the emphasis for years has been on how to treat God and not how we treat other people, especially those around and among us, we treat God with a lot of attention, a lot of respect, a lot of everything, but we renegade, de-emphasize, despise, overlook, and think that the way we treat other people are not important. Many people don't even think it's worth the while, how you treat people. Some people assume that it's not, it's not important. And even where people think that it's important, it is only in structured relationships. How husband will treat wife. How wife will treat husband. Structured relationship. How sisters treat brothers. How you treat your in-laws. Those are structured relationships. But we feel that when it comes to just every other person, our colleague at work, our neighbors in the place where we dwell, our classmates, uh, our, the person sitting next to me, we do not, as it were, take a little bit of care to look at what the word of God has to say about how we ought to treat others. And when it comes to what affects churches most, let me tell you this. People don't understand this. And what affects people most is not the way we treat God, but the way we treat other people. Let me tell you this. <laughs> it's something, this is an area where ministries differ from ministries, churches differ from churches, and people differ from one another, the way we treat other people. It's not the way we treat God, but rather how we treat other people. It is one thing that differentiates churches from each other, ministries from each other. And let me say this to you, whether you know it or not. God is bound to send more people to us if we treat the people he has sent well. And God is not bound to keep sending people to us if we do not treat the ones he has sent with decency. You don't justify more people if you have not handled the one he sent the proper way. It's just like you don't justify more financial blessing from God if you have not used the one he sent to you in the right and the decent way. And whether you know it or not, let me say this to you. One important secret of church growth, church stability, enlargement and influence is the people will gravitate to a church where they are made to feel human, where they are treated with respect and honor and stay away from churches no matter what building you have, no matter what anointing flows, where they will not be treated as they should be treated. God will send more people. Look at it. Jeremiah chapter 5, 3 verse 15. He said he will send people to pastors who will feed them. Feeding does not only mean preaching. In fact, people, sheep will lie down in green pastures. Green pastures does not only talk about messages. It talks about the caring ministry. He said he maketh me to lie down, to settle in. People don't settle in churches, not because the word is not powerful, not because the word is not there, but people come with a lot of things that need caring for. And that is what differentiates church from church. I've been in many pulpits all over the world, all on the six continents of the world. I've been in pulpits, 126 nations, all kind of denominations, all kind of congregations, small one, big one, denominations that are so big that there are people in overflow, about five or six overflows round about. And denominations that are so small that we sat on a chair. We didn't need microphone, just talk with mouth. And I can tell you, God will keep sending more people because God's possession is his sheep. And he cares about them. And if you not care for them the way God will care for them, he won't send them to you anymore. 
But if you care for them, the way he cares for them, he will keep sending them. Let me say this to you. Why was it that everybody wanted a little piece about Jesus Christ? Why? The way he treated people. That was a key that was different from the Pharisees. The Sadducees described the Herodians. Multitude came from everywhere. Old, young, rich, poor, people who were active in adultery, fornication, they came. Mark 1, 45 said they came to him from every quarter. Why? Because of the way he treated people. He treated children well. The people who are living in the city treated them well. The scribes, the religious hierarchy of his day, treated them well. I mean, people who were around him were mesmerized. And that was how he had that crowd. Because he had a handsome way in which he treated people. But why is it today that we are having to struggle to fill church buildings? Jesus said in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up, he didn't say just lift it up, Jesus said, lift Jesus with mouth. The way to lift it up is to learn from him as to how he treated people. And from the way he treated people, people stick with him. He had this stickability, whereby the people that came remained. Many churches have structures in place, but the greatest structure we can have is that a church, we must be a church that is known for how we treat people. How we treat people. When I go to one ministry or another ministry, I notice that in fact, there are some ministries that I go to preach, and I always imagine that if I'm a member, will I stay? With this way that you are treating people, we're treating me, guest minister, who is just on a visit, and I'll be going in a month, a week's time. If you treat me like this, then I can imagine those people who are not in the position of authority like I am, how the way you have been treating them. God will send more people to us if we treat the one he sent. And people will gravitate to us if we give them something that they can easily find. People want to know. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. People are looking for a place where they will be treated right. I'm saying this to you today, and I want you to understand. Let me say five things, first of all. Number one, our church and us, we need people in our lives. There are some people you need in your life now. Now, not because you never had such people before, but you never treated them well, so they are gone. So we will always need people. For the next level of this church ministry, we will need more people. We will never get to a point, and no church ever gets to that point where that church will not need people anymore. You will always need people. Number two, your greatest asset as a human being, our greatest asset as a church are the people God will send to us as gifts. The Bible said he led captivity captives and he gave gifts as men. Psalm 68, verse 18, he gave gifts as men. So, the, the next asset, the most important asset of any person are the people in your life. Let me tell you this. When I say many things about myself, it's because I have people in my life. People are in my life. And I want you to know that a church is the greatest asset of a church are not the building, not the choir, not the instruments you have. They are the people. Let me say this to you. It has been discovered that 86% of people who come to a church and stay there were people invited by people from that church who also helped in teaching them well. Our greatest access for church goes to our people. And so if a lot is not done to teach, to train, to instruct, to guide, to lead, to structure people as to how we treat people, we can have all the publicity on the internet. We can have a TV program. And churches without TV programs, we get the results because they have a one-on-one -on -one and a handy way of treating people. Number three, not just that we need people, not just that the people God sent to us are assets. Number three, the role of everybody God sends to us are different. So no person replaces another one. The role of everybody 
in our lives are different. And so, you can't say this person has been here and I don't need it again. And then you are reaching for another person. Let me tell you this. That other person cannot do and will not be what the person you have abandoned is supposed to do and the reason for which they are there. You need to understand this. All of us are different. No one is a replacement for another person. No one is a replacement. That's why we are different. Because we have our peculiar roles. There are people this church need that if they don't come here, this church will not fulfill everything God had in mind for it. And so we need to keep attracting people. Not just attracting them, but retaining them. When I look at my ministry and my life, I can tell you the various people and what they did. And they are still doing. And everybody who have come into my life, as much as possible, Jesus says something. He said, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And I will not lose any of them. I talk, I'm talking about learning from Christ. He never lost anyone. He made all the effort to keep everyone. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives to me. Because he said, whosoever coming to me, I will in no wise cast out. Even if one of them stray, I go after them. I leave the 99 and then I go after that one. To ensure that, listen, until that person stubbornly says, I'm not coming back, God does not replace them. But if God sent them, their purpose is not yet done. To everything, there is a time and a season to every purpose. And for everyone who God sends into your life. You see, some of us, you struggle in an area today you shouldn't be struggling in. Why? The persons God sent to you to do that thing, you drove them away. You didn't treat them well. Now, even you, no matter what you want to do, if you treat, look, there have been people I had money in my pocket when I was a young, uncle Christian. I wanted to give the pastor, the minister, but the way he treated me, I went back home with my money. It's not by force. If you can't receive me, you can't receive what I have. So it's important for you to understand that. And this is something I learned from Jesus. The way he treated everybody nicely, children. When the children came in, Mark 10, and they requested, oh, little children, they want to meet Jesus. The apostle said, no, 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 bring them back. But Jesus said, no, 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 don't resist them. Bring them. And he took them in his hand, verse 16, and he blessed them. He treated them well. The woman was caught in adultery. I mean, what can be more terrible than that? Treated him well. Did he treat Judas badly? No. Did he treat uh, uh, Peter badly? No. Doubting Thomas, did he treat him badly? No. He came onto his own, uh, and he's even the thief on the cross. A thief, this man has been a career criminal. Last minute, the man said, look, I want to be with you in your kingdom. He said, today you'll be with me. Look at that. If it is someone saying, ah, you just want to, no, there's no shortcut to heaven, no. Now, you, you still talk like that, but he never talked like that. That's to let you know how open his heart is. Everybody in our life has his own role. And so don't say one person has come. And so, and then the, the fifth thing I want to say, have I said five things or four things now? Three things, okay. Let me say, every one of us, we need someone. Number two, the people in our lives are assets. Number three, uh, okay, number three is that uh, the purpose of one person no, is not replaced by another person. Number four, this is what you need to also need to understand. That we should not keep taking from people. We should also put into people. Don't keep taking from people. You are not here to be a consumer, but to be a producer. You are supposed to put back into people. You are supposed to give back. That is what life is about. Give, it shall be given to you. I don't just look at people around me and say, okay, this man is a protocol person. He's here to serve me. I look at how I can serve him. You are not just here to be a church member and be a blessing to our church. I look for how I can be a blessing to you as well. I mean, I'm not just here for me to be, for the legend to be a blessing to me. I think of practical ways in which I can be a blessing. And then the fifth thing I would love to say to you is that every one of us need to learn how to treat people. We need to learn it. And I'm going to explain to you why that is important. I mean, when I was studying scriptures, I was studying the Bible and I saw 
so many kind of counsels that the word of God talks about the way we treat people. For example, it says, do not provoke or envy one another. In Galatians 6, 26. If you provoke someone, you're not treating him well. If you envy someone, that's not what the way you should treat him. And you find that in Galatians 5, 26. He said, we should not hate one another. Jesus said, they hated me without a reason. John, John 15, 25 said, they hated me without a reason. And Titus chapter 3, verse 3 says, we should not hate one another. But you know, there are Christians who hate other people. They hate their neighbor. They hate their, their colleagues. They even hate other workers within the same church. God's word also says we should not judge one another. Romans 14, 4. Who are that that judged another Roman servant? To his master, he standard of finally God is able to make him stand. John 7, 1. He said, judge not so that you don't be judged. But we judge people. We judge them so far. You know very little about people. Your guesses are wrong at the best. Your assumptions about people are not right. Many times we think some people are proud or cocky to us, but the problem is your own pride is the real reason. It's important for us to understand. Bible says don't judge. He said don't even have grudge against one another. James chapter 5 verse 9. Don't have grudges. There are people who have grudge. They say you are Christians. Your Christianity is immobilized by grudges. Keeping resentments. Bitterness. And you, you, you just, you just it's, it grudge people and you say you are a Christian. And the Bible says it clearly, James 5, 9. It said, don't even bear fault with us against thy neighbor. We say things about our neighbor that we don't know. That is bearing false witness. He said, don't defraud your neighbor. Don't take from them things by style. Don't backbite. Don't bite. Don't backbite. So many things that the Bible talks about as to don't deceive your neighbor. Don't deceive, don't deceive your pastor. Don't deceive your friend. Don't deceive. Don't deceive your boyfriend. Don't deceive your girlfriend. These are things that you do, and some of us do it, and think you are getting away with it. But you never find it in Christ. He never deceived anybody. He never defrauded anybody. He never said anything behind. You won't see Jesus Christ sitting there to discuss the issue of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He can just make a mention of it here and there. Move on. He was not so critical like some people do. Let me tell you something. If some of us have lived in the days of Jesus Christ, we would have believed just like the Pharisees. They don't believe. I was telling you, was it on Friday? That if you are the husband of Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, this girl you have courted her for a few months, you have known her for one or two years, suddenly you came one day and said she's pregnant. Who pregnant her at the Holy Ghost? Will you believe her? Joseph was ready to make an example of her. But when God spoke to him, he stopped it. Now that is power. That is discipline. Look at the way Jesus dealt with people. I have learned a lot from the way he dealt with people. And that is one thing that first of all that struck me. And I'm going to give you more insights into that. Now let me say this to you. And let me say it very clearly. Because we have not been dealing with people... The way we should deal with them, we have had five things that have happened. As an individual and as a church, because we have not been de dealing with people and treating people the way we should treat them, let me tell you five things that have happened. Number one, many people have been mistreated. Many people have been maltreated. People have been taken for granted. Individuals have been messed up, and some have even backslidden. Because we don't treat people well. I've met people who stopped going to church for 13 years because of the way I don't just spoke to them. They want to hear the word. But the usher, who is to be the first contact point, was a wrong representation for the church, a wrong ambassador of the church. People have been messed up, misbehaved. People's, people who should be in church have been thrown out of the church because they were wrongly handled. They were not handled well with skill in line with scriptures. Number two, because we have not been treating people well, individually and even as a church, we have suffered. There are some things you are trying to do that shouldn't be as difficult as this if only you have people. 
I always tell people, accept a country where I have never been. If you want to go there, I, just one text, one phone call, and everything is resolved. Somebody told me I'm relocating to New Brunswick. I said, don't worry, two minutes. Bah, bah, bah. I call somebody, please help collect this person. The man said, how do you do this? I learned from Christ. I learned from Christ. The wives of senior officers of Herod were ministering to Jesus Christ. You see, when I see some ministers brag on TV, I always say to them, what, what's he talking about? Whether you know it or not, human beings are vehicles to take you to the next place where you are going in life. Individuals have suffered. Because you see, not that you did not have people, but when they came into your life, you felt problem because somebody else had come, you throw them away. And nobody wants to be treated like that. Even whatever they have, which they want to offer you, you have refused to accept it. They have not finished their work. It's important for you to know that until certain people finish their assignment in our lives, they should not be kicked away, or else we jeopardize God sending people still to our lives in the future. Churches have suffered. One of my sons was telling me recently, he has a church of 75 people. He said last year, 2023, 1,750 people came to their church as first-timers. But the church is still 75. They have turned his church to a revolving door. You open the front door, they come in. You open the back door, they leave. Leakages and drainages of people who come to the church should not be blamed on our not being anointed, our not preaching, but our mismanagement of human beings. We need to develop our people's skills and how we treat people. I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. I want you to understand this. I'm saying this as someone who knows what is going on. I'm not a novice, and I'm not someone who probably experiences are like little or minimal. I want you to know this, number three. Because we have not been treating people right, and we have not learned how to treat people, we have been wrong advertisements for the gospel. Wrong advertisements for the gospel. The way you treat your co-workers in your place of work is either a good advertisement for the gospel and this church or a wrong advertisement for the gospel and this church. Some people look at you and say, hmm, if I'm going to be a Christian like Sister Stella, I will never be. Why are they doing that? You, you are snobbish. You are arrogant. You look down, you despise people. Proverbs 14, 21. He that despises his neighbor sin it. Proverbs 11, 12. He that despises his neighbor is someone without understanding. You are cocky. You are full of yourself. And Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. If you can do nothing, it means you are nothing. It's important that anybody to know that anything, anybody who is full of himself is, doesn't have God's stop signs in them. Because we have not learned how to treat people and we have not been taught how to treat people, we have been wrong advertisement for the gospel. Number four, because we have not learned how to treat people, and because we have not been taught how to treat people, the body of Christ as a whole have suffered. Christianity today is growing at the rate of 1.2%. Islam is growing at the rate of 1.9%. Let me tell you this. A man opened a bare parlor in front of a church. A church had this part of the building, and the bear parlor was opposite the building. The bear parlor owner said, he said, when I came and opened my store, he said, I thought the church was going to close me down. Five years after, the bear parlor closed the church down. Why? Most of the people in the bear parlor became patrons of the, bear, of, of, of the church, became patrons of the bear parlor. Why? Because of the way he treated the customer service. Customer service is mesmerizing. He said, I thought they were going to close me down. But I was the one who closed them down. So he called the pastor. When the pastor could no longer sustain the building up, he said, Pastor, let me tell you this. You have a good message, but the wrong packaging. He said, the way you treat your members, he said, they come here and drink, and from what they say about the way they are treated there, he said, they are discouraged. He said, I tell them, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. We, we appreciate your, your, your business. We, we long for He said many of them, when they stopped coming to church, they were still coming to drink there. 
They will have given an excuse of why they stopped coming to church. The church is far. I changed houses. So, but they kept coming for his pepper soup and the other things that he offered. Should it be like that? The body of Christ have suffered. And number five, because we have not learned how to, how to, how to uh, treat people right. And we have not been taught. You know what has happened? The work of God has been made more difficult than usual. It's like we are using a basket to fetch water. Abba! We spend so much money to float a program, to invite quality ministers. People who are not of this fold come. But with the way we treat them, they cannot stay. They will have lied down in green pastures if they are as pastoral provision care. You know one thing I prayed for you, these guys, this morning, this church? I pray that this church will be a church where when people come, we will not just say we love them, we appreciate them, but we will show them with our action because action speaks louder than voice. From a time when I go to a city, I have three or four churches or five churches I attend in that city. So when I see someone who has strayed from the church I go in another church, I was like, what are you looking for here? Let me tell you, the common thing is they don't know how to treat people in that church. It's the common thing. Not that the anointing is more. Anybody who knows God knows that God is in every place. And that there's nothing to look for. But when you see shift, uh, sheep most moving and moving and moving and moving in the same place, in the same community, the greatest diagnosis is that they don't feel well treated. In the next few minutes, I want to tell you why the way we treat people is very important. Why is it important the way we treat people? Now, let me say this to you. If the way we treat people is not important, the word of God will not have recommended it. The word of God recommends how you treat people. The woman who had a, 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 a child that was demonic in Matthew 15, who brought the child... And the apostles were stopping, stopping the, don't bring, don't, don't disturb the man of God. You will see the way Jesus treated that woman. Because you know, what the people say, well, and we don't give uh, uh, what belongs to the children, to, to, to dogs. The woman said, even the one that fall from the ground, who won't take the children, the one that fall from the ground, who want to eat it? Jesus looked at her and said, wow, I have not found great faith. So, not in Israel. And he treated the woman and his child with dignity. And no ministry where you go, you'll be dehumanized. The process it takes for you to see the pastor, the time and the energy you expend for you to get the kind of responses, it's just irritating. Did we learn that from Christ? Ephesians 4.20, he said, have we so learned Christ? Philippians 4.9, the things you have learned, you have received, you have heard and seen in me, do it. Do what you have learned, you have seen, you have heard in Christ. And that is why I tell people when I go to places, the way I treat people is most important to me. Because ministry is about people. The church is not a business. The church is not an organization. The church is not a building. The church is an organism. And organism is important how we treat them. It's only in structural relationship. Okay, I know how to treat the, uh, my, uh, my wife. I know how to treat my husband. I know how to treat my, my brother in Christ, sister in Christ. No. The early church, listen, look. I mean, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it said they had favor with all the people. The early church treated people well. The poor was welcome. Tall, short, everybody welcome. Ignorant, foolish. I remember some years ago in our church, growing up as a young pastor. I saw this man in church. So after the service, I tried to greet him. And I discovered the man does not even speak English. So I said, ah, why do you come to this church? He said, I didn't come to this church to learn English. Oh. He said, the way your people treat me is why I'm here. He said, just sitting down around here. I looked at him. In fact, that was one of the inspiration for which we started vernacular speaking churches, Yoruba church. 
The man was coming. He had been coming for three, four years. And he couldn't speak English. So I said, when I preach, he said, ah, I laugh with him. When everybody's laughing, I laugh too. Now, what was it that kept him in church? The way he was being treated. Why is the way we treat people important? God's word recommend how we ought to treat people because it's important. And I'm going to give you reasons why God recommends how we treat people. You see, the word of God is very clear as to how we treat people. God's word recommend it. It's not just how we treat God that is important. God said how you treat people is also important. Number one, why does God's word recommend how we treat people? Because he knows it isn't man's nature to treat others in the way he wants them treated. It isn't man's nature. Man is not God. There is a nature in God that wants to make God treat people the way he treats them. And he knows that that thing is not in man. He knows it's not in man. Man, ordinarily, physically, naturally, is selfish. And he wouldn't treat people the way a selfless God would treat people. That is why the Bible recommends how to treat people. Number two, why does God recommend how we need to treat people? Because of the way he, God, treats them. He wants others who, she, who, who share others with him to show them the same way they ought to be treated. God creates everybody. Man by nature won't treat others the way God will treat them. But God had to recommend it to show us the way he treats others so that we can join him. So treating others is a way of joining God to do for his creation what he, God, wants to be done. God is in heaven, we are on the earth. We are co-laborers. 1 Corinthians 3.9 2 Corinthians 6 1, we are co workers. Jesus said, My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. So, the way we treat others is our way of showing God that we stand for the same thing God stands for. So, God's word recommend the way we treat others because of the way He, God, treats them. He wants others who share others with Him to show them the same respect that he shows to them. Do you know God honor everybody? Honor all men. I don't have to be a man of substance, a man of grace, a man of honor for you to honor me. Honor all men. Where I come from, the Yoruba language, it says everybody deserves to be honored, irrespective of who they are. I know it's a culture of the mouth here. Though not many people understand what they are saying. They say, I honor you, but the actions are different. And we only honor those who are high up there. We don't know that our colleagues need to be honored. We don't know that those who are coming behind us need to be honored. We don't know that the basis of men also need honor. The basis of men also need honor. Number three, why is it that God recommends how we ought to treat people? Because he knows the expectation of man, which many of us do not know of. Do you know there is no man who does not expect to be honored? There is no man who does not expect to be loved the way they are. But God loved us the way we are. While we are asking us, he loved us. God knows the expectation of people who come to church. Do you know that when people are coming to church, one thing in their mind is, will these people really treat me well? When a woman wants to get married, she's thinking, will my husband treat me well? Children, when they are born in a home, will my father treat me well? Will my in-laws treat me well? Everybody's needing a treatment. There is, is needing a treatment. One thing that endears me to church is the way they treat me. Not just me alone, but I want to see the same thing reproducing the way they treat their members. Because in the final analysis, all of us are equal before God. Romans 2.11, for God is no respecter of persons. 
Romans 10, 12, there's no difference between the Jews and the Greeks. For the same Lord over all is equal to all that call upon his name. Ephesians 6, 9, neither is God respect of persons. Colossians 3, 25, God is no respect of persons. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them both. Why does God recommend how we treat people? Because he knows the expectation of man. Man needs, wants to be treated. That's why he says, I will send my sheep to a place where they will be well taken care of. It's the expectation of everybody. And the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 18, Proverbs 24, 14, the expectation of the righteous shall be granted. Number four, why does God's word recommend how to treat people? He recommends how we should treat people. So he wants us to do it in ways... He asks us to do it, to, to, to do it so that, no, let me, see, let me read it like this. He, he recommends us to do it the way we should do it so that we will not do it our own way. When it, when, when it comes to prayer, it tells you how to pray. When it tells you to give, it tells you how to give. When he tells you to relate to people, he also tells you. Because if God wants to do something and does not specify it's supposed to be done, then there will be abuse. There are husbands who got married without being told how to treat their wives. There are wives who got married without being educated as to how to treat the husband. That is why in our church, when it comes to marriage, the first cause for a single sister is how to take care of a man. Some sisters can take care of themselves. They know how to fix the, the false eyelashes to, to, make, to remove the, the hair and relocate it somewhere. They know how to dress. They know how to paint. They know how to color. They know how to put on the wig. But they don't know how to treat a man. They don't know how to treat a man. And the first cause in our models for men is how to treat a woman. There are many, you see, some of those stupid things you kneel down to give a woman a ring. That's stupidity. When you kneel down, that's the first and last time you ever kneel down. The next thing is you begin to walk upon them. You travel upon serpents and scorpions and all the parts of, you, you turn them to, to foot marks. You don't know how to treat a woman. Is it kneel down? Hey, will you marry me? <laughs> what, what are we dealing with here? You don't know how to commend a woman? You don't know how to appreciate a woman? You don't know how to build a woman up? You don't know how to have to polish a woman? You don't know how to bless a woman? I mean, my wife said this. I've been married for 40 years. He said, if I have it again, 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 to choose again, he said, I will choose you forever. <laughs> have improved in 40 years. I have learned, and as members of a church, learn in your place of work, learn how to treat people. Some people will greet you joyfully. Just, uh, and you still want those people to celebrate you? You despise them? They are gifts with nothing? They give you probably a $10 or $20? You don't really thank God for them? You complain about what you don't have instead of appreciating what you have? Why does God go recommend it? Because he wants us to do it in the way he wants us to do it, not in our own way. Isaiah 55 has said, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. But one thing about God is that he made his way known. Psalm 103 verse 7, unto Moses. And it's absent to the children of Israel. When God wants anything done, he tells you how to go about it. We just had the Holy Communion. There was a procedure to it. God is a God of order. You can't be sloppy. God is on the altar of confusion. You just don't treat people anyhow and expect them not to kick. Even your children, you can't treat them anyhow. I remember so many years ago, you know, whenever I'm traveling, I always tell my, I always tell my, my wife, I'm traveling, I'm traveling. So one day, my wife, my, myself and my children were just talking. I said, describe daddy in a few words. He said, daddy is somebody who, when he's leaving, does not tell anybody. In other words, they expect me to tell them. He said, you only tell mommy, you don't tell us. So it was then I discovered that that's true. I don't tell them. Oh. So whenever I'm traveling, 
I'll tell them that is traveling in a week's time. Say, okay, daddy, tell us when it's closed. So I call them, daddy is traveling. When would daddy be back? When would daddy be back? I will tell them, and then at times when I travel, they say, daddy, you, you travel, you don't talk, talk to us. It's only when you are here, you talk. When you are traveling, you don't talk to us. You know, I didn't know that even such little things matter. Jesus had to speak to children. There's this song that says, Jesus loved the little children, all ye children of... You see, many things that you and I at times, there are churches that don't have a children's church. There are churches like that. There are churches that don't invest in a children's church. That is why the future of the church is not guaranteed if the present children are not treated well. When we treat children as a menace, when people visit me, I don't tell my children to go, 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 go into the room. Go, no, no. I tell them to sit down. Sit down and hear. Sit down and learn. We are not committing a crime. When people visit me, my children sit down. They don't go anywhere. They sit down. They hear. And one of them came to me one day and said, Daddy, the man that visited you the other time, he, 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 the, the, the shoe he wore was different color. You know what I said? I said, he has so many of them. He doesn't even know which one is which anymore. <laughs> After the, he, he noticed that. I didn't even notice it. When God wants something, now what does he do? He gives us a guideline. He wants you to pray. When you pray, enter into that closet. When I have entered thy door, pray unto the Father who shared in secret. When you give, don't let, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. All of those things. When you fast, this how to do it. So what, why did he give us guidelines? So that you not do it the way you want to do it. Because anything that God wants done, if not clearly indicated as to how it's supposed to be done, it will be subject to abuse. Number five, why will God recommend how we ought to treat people? Because he has given us the capacity to do it. Let me tell you this. Every one of us can treat the people in our lives right. We can treat the people in our life, right? You have the capacity. Where did the capacity come from? Romans 5, 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart. You and I have capacity to treat people right. Even when you feel treating them wrong, you have, there is grace to treat people right. There is grace to bless those who curse you. There is grace to pray for those who despise you, use your persecute you. There is grace to love your enemies. You know what? I love my enemies. You know what? There are many things about myself I did not know it was my enemies that made me see it. I love them. Why would you do that? I have capacity to. They are helpers of destiny. Many of my enemies trained me, taught me how not to do things in the wrong way because they're out to see what I'm doing and the way I'm doing it. My enemies see my flaws more than my friends. My friend don't see any, ah, daddy, <laughs> it is well. But my enemies, I went to Malaysia to preach. After I finished preaching, three young men walked to me and said, excuse me, sir, can we say something? I said, yes. They said, tonight you quoted 145 scriptures, you got three wrong. I said, three? I said, I tried. They said, no, you didn't try. What they told us was that you are a Bible computer. Now, you have not proven you are a computer. I said, even computers failed. They said, no, 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 they didn't tell us that. They told us you are a Bible computer. So we just wanted to know that you are not as good as you think you are. Ah, oh. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I said, okay, can you quote? He said, no, we are not Bible computers. It is you that they say is Bible computer. I said, so why have you come like this? They said, we just wanted to know that you have to be very careful because you are not a computer. I said, even computers failed. They said, no, no, that's not what you are told. They told us you are accurate. And we kept expecting it. And we discovered that you are not that good. You are not that good. <laughs> now, from that day, I became careful. Whenever I'm not, when my computer is not working well, it's not booting well, like Pastor Andrew's one was not booting well this morning. He was trying to quote Ephesians 2 6. He quoted Ephesians 2 8. <laughs> eh? Because I know people are out there looking for little things. They want me to dot the I's and cross the T's. They are there trying to catch me in my talk. 
So I had to raise my level of specialization. I had to live my level of performance. Do you know there are people who come here to spy out the way we do things? And what they will go with is the, the things we don't do. They will go away from this place criticizing. I always say like this, if the board learns how to fly without perching, the hunter must learn to shoot without missing. Why does God recommend? Because he has given us the capacity. I can do all things. Hey, this woman is very quarrelsome. I can do all things. This son is an impossible son. I can do. You see, we only can do what we want to do. But God wants us to do everything and he has given us the capacity to do it. You can love your enemies or else he won't ask you to do it. You can bless those that cost your ass who has to do it. You can ask you to give. There's nothing like for those who don't have to give. Everybody's got something to give. You've given your life. Every other thing you have in your life can be given. I've been to churches before where people removed their bones straight weak and gave it. Oh, yeah. When they, had, they say, I don't have money in my purse. I said, that head gear. Oh, yeah. Put it in the offering bowl. Hebrews 13, 16, to do good and to communicate, forget not, for we shall sacrifices. What I'm saying is something I want us as a church to inculcate. Why does God recommend? Why does God recommend how we ought to treat people? It, it will show us as his disciples. The real banner of a disciple is doing things the way Jesus would have done it. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another even as I've loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love. The emblem is love and love will cover a multitude of sin. John, I mean Proverbs 10, 12, hatred, shattered of strife, love covereth the multitude of sin. Though your sins, the other person's sin may be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, they shall be as white as wool. You know what? Anybody can fault us in this church for anything, but don't let them fault us anymore as to how we treat people. Not that they have a reason to call us a bad name. We are disciples of Christ. We stand for what Jesus stands for. We will do things the way Jesus will do it. Who will treat people the way Jesus will treat them. One man left our church for 30 years. He went to 12 churches. He came back. When I saw him 30, I said, ah, are you back? He said, yes. I said, why are you back? He says, uh, nobody, no places like what I said. I said, it's not, not, not me spiritual. He said, I went to churches. There was no church that treated me the way I'm treated here. He faced the humiliation. Do you know there are people who can leave a church but can come back five years, 10 years, 15 years? Why? They have not been able to see in other places what they saw here. Let that be the kind of church we have. Where when they go, they will come back. In other words, let me come and be going only to come and not go anymore. People have left that church for eight years. 10 years, 30 years, the last one, 15 years, he came to the convention so that we not see him. But after convention, when the guest, guest crowd, you know, when you have guest lecturers, you have guest members. When the guest lecturer leaves, a guest minister leaves, the guest members also leave. So it became who know who. I saw him say, come, come, uh -uh. have you started coming? <laughs> He says, sir, I try to access the pastor from these churches, not as big as this. He said, they won't allow me to access them. They say, I have to go through this one, go through this one. He said, there was a church, they put me on row 12, for two weeks before I can see the pastor. A week to the day, they said the pastor travel and they're going to research it again. He said, ah! He said, I cannot see the pastor, can I see Jesus? It's an emblem of true disciples. They love. Jesus said, greater love than this has no man that a man should lay down his life. For his friends. He said, I call you no longer servant, but friends. 
Let us have that emblem. Number seven, why does God's word and Jesus recommend how we ought to treat people? Because when we do it, it the way he recommends is going to put us also in line to be treated well. Let me say this to you. Listen carefully to me. People don't treat you the way they treat you because of who they are. People treat you the way they feel you treat them. They treat you not because they are bad people. People treat us the way they feel us treat them. If you neglect people, you may never know that that's what you've done. But when your time comes that need their attention, they will neglect you. And if you ask them deeply, why are you doing this? They will tell you, you did it to me first. Let me tell you this, I have a son, 40-year-old son. He did something and I was, I shouted at him, I shouted at him, I shouted at him. He kept quiet, respect. He went away. So one day, I called him, I said, I was talking to him, and he shouted at me too. Ah! He shouted at me too. I said, you are shouting at me? He said, you shouted at me first. No, you're my father, but you shouted at me first. Don't I have dignity? Because I'm your son? Should I be treated anyhow? Don't I have my position? Am I not your first son, the beginning of your strength? He shouted at me, you wouldn't listen to me. He said, I wouldn't listen to you too. Ah! What will you do? Ah. That was the day I knew that fathers don't provoke your son. He said, he said, he, he said, they are saying, you quote Bible. He said, you too don't provoke me. You provoke me all the time. Huh? I had to hold him and say, I'm sorry. He said, hey. Uh, you think I'm not human? The day you shouted at me, he gave me the date, 14th of April, so and so. Said, you shouted at me. You treat me like I'm nobody. I'm a married man. I, have my, I gave my life to Christ. I'm a minister of the gospel. You lay your hands on me, but don't shout at me. Ah, okay. <laughs> People don't treat you because of who they are, but because of they are responding to the way you treated them earlier. So Matthew 7, 13, 12 says, as you want men to do to you. So whenever you are treating people in a particular way, do not treat them the way they, I mean, do not treat them in the way they treat you. Treat them in the way you want them to treat you. Treat them. One pastor came to, he came and invited me from Lauren to his church in Lagos. When I went there, I said, I want to stay in Sharon. I said, ah, he's too expensive. Oh. He said, I have a boy's quarters. He said, it's good. I said, well, if it's good, you move into the boy's quarter when I come, and then I'll move into the main house because it's good. You told me it's good. <laughs> to cut the long story short, I stayed in that hotel at my own cost. I came to minister for him. I stayed there at my own cost. So I invited him again, come. And he came. I, I, pre- I put him in the most expensive place I could find the presidential lodge of the governor's house. I gave him the best of option. I gave him the best of, I mean, I took care of him. I gave him things, and then when he was going, the honorarium he gave me, I multiplied it by five, and I gave it to him. When I gave it to the honorarium, he went and opened it. He says, sir, I'm sorry. I said, what are you sorry about? He said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, you have shown me the way I should have treated you. He said, I understand the language, sir. He said, come one more time, just one. I have not been able to go back, I'm afraid. (laughs) Not been able to go back. Why does he tell us how to treat people? Because when we do it, the way he recommends, it puts us also in line to be well treated. Let me say this, if you treat every person the way Jesus wants you to treat them, you are putting yourself in line also to be treated by others the way Jesus will treat you. Do you understand that? All of us can be stranger in any place at any time. 
And when you are a stranger in a place, you want to be well treated. Let me give you one or two more before I begin to tie up this message. Now, another reason why he recommends it is that when we do it, it is his way, actually, it is when we treat people the way he recommends in the scriptures, it means we are treating him, God, in that way. Now, listen. Do you know when you treat a child of God or any human being created by God, the way God will treat them, do you know it is God you are treating? Whosoever receives you, God says, whosoever receives you, receiveth me. Whosoever receiveth me, receiveth he that sent me. Matthew 10, 40. If you treat people well, you are treating, God says, he's touching me. If you give a poor person food, God says, it's not that person you are giving, it's me. It's me you are giving the food to. But you see, many times we don't know that when we treat people anyhow, these are human beings who are creating the image and likeness of God. These are people that God has sent to us. These are people who have come to us under the direction of God. And it is God. God said, if you do this for any one of this list, you've done it to me. Proverbs 19, 17, he that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. And that which he has given shall be given back to him. Am I helping anybody this day? Yeah. Let me say this to you. Our word level may not improve. Our auditorium may not be finer than this. But when we change our customer service by you in your place of work, you where you live, you when you go to the African store, treat people well. Let me give you a good example. I was in a suya store one day. There's a suya store near my house. And I went there. And I saw people who were buying various things. And the Holy Spirit said to me, pay for all of them. Now, I don't know them. I don't know them. I said, I should pay everybody. Irrespective of what they are bought. <laughs> and God said, yes. And I paid for everybody. 450 pounds. It was suya that I went there for. <laughs> now I've inherited a, debt, a, a bill for 50 pounds. And Jesus said to me, after, after I left the place, he said, you did that for me. I said, but I don't know whether they're born again or not. See, I created them. And I said, he said, I know what things they have need of when they came there. There are some of them, it was their last change. Some of them could not even afford it. Now, that same Sunday, I went to a church. Not a big church. Probably half of this size. Just about 50 people. And the pastor came to me after the service and said, Sir, I had this check that I have reserved to give you. It is 2,000 pounds for today that you have come to bless us. He said, but God told me I should give you 12,000 pounds extra. I asked the pastor, I said, why? He said, Jesus told me to do it. You know what taught Jesus? What I did. Right. Were those people members of those church? No. God rewarded the righteous. Yeah. Psalm 58, verse 11. The Lord rewarded the righteous. When you do treat people the way God command, I can assure you of one thing. God says, I'm the one you are touching. I'm the one you are touching. Matthew 18 verse 5. I want to give you one more here. If we do, if we treat people the way God says we should treat them, we are going to be rewarded. And if we don't, we are going to be punished for it. A church can be punished for it. You can be punished for it. And I've seen people who we are punished for it. Quickly because of time. So I can round up this one. There are ways you should not treat people. I'm going to just spell them out, a few of them. I know my time is well spent, but I need to spell this out. Then I will tell you how to treat people. And let this church be a church that is known for how to treat people. Everybody is important. I always tell people in our church, everybody is a VIP, very important person. They are the apple of his eyes. They are flesh of his flesh. They are the bone of his bone. 
He created them in his own image. Even the sinner is in the image and the likeness of God. He may not have realized his potential, but this he will do if you and I treat them with... Look, people will follow you from your place of work to your church if you treat them well. I was a lecturer for 13 years. My students and staff that I led to Christ were over 5,032 when I was a lecturer for 13 years. Many of them would just come to me. I remember one girl came to me and said, I, he said, can you be my boyfriend? I said, why not? I mean, I said that. I said, why not? I said, but there is only one condition. You must be born again and spirit filled. And we're going to take you through deliverance. He said, that's no problem. Oh, okay. So she came to church. This is a girl who, she has not gone to church before then for 15 years. The last time she went to church, she was eight. For 15 years, she had never been to any church. So she came to church that day. I finished preaching. And while I gave the other call, she was the first person to come out. And she was raising her head like this in front of me. Right here. <laughs> other sheep have I who are not yet of this fold. Everything has a, everybody has a price. The price for her is for me to be her boyfriend. All right, there's a bet there. So she did like this. I said, okay. After they came out, they gave the light to Christ. said, go into the council and they will minister to you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When I got to my office, I wrote to I said, make sure you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Though. Because you cannot be my girlfriend and will be on the same level if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. So they laid hands on her. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. She manifested demons. They cast everything out, cast everything out. So at the end, when she had finished, she was dirty all over. She passed through my office. She said, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I speak in talk. I said, okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. He said, so when will you see me? I said, I will see you two days from now. So two days, I went to her at home. When I got there, I said, let's pray in tongues first. So we prayed in tongues for one hour. Then I said, so when do we start? He said, it's not going to be good though. I said, how? I said, mm -mm. He said, my, I, I don't feel okay again. I don't want you as boyfriend. You're my daddy now. <laughs> Even there are some people I know, they will say, come out of her, you foul spirit. Come out, out, out. I didn't do that. Today, she is a pastor of a church in London, over 500 people. Whenever I see her, I say, when is my girlfriend visiting me? He said, ah, daddy. He said, those are the days of blindness. He said, but you, he said, the way you welcomed me was so disarming. He said, you, you disarmed me. He said, why you say you agree? I said, ah, hey. He said, but the condition you gave was a good condition. He said, look at what my life is. When she was married, I was one who gave her like this to the husband. The father said, no, I don't qualify because this girl I know before was a rascal. Now this new bomb person, you know, now you go give her my auto. I said, now me, oh. The father sat down like this, who give it? He said, now me. The father said, yes, I second it. Now what I'm saying to you was that the thing that won her was the way I treated her. How are we not to treat people quickly? I'll give you about seven, though, there are about ten of that. How are we not to treat people? I'm going to rush through how we not to treat people. You see, because people say, you see here in Luke 10, Jesus was talking about how we treat other people. The lawyer was there. The priest was there. The Levite was there. And the Samaritan, who was not a priest, who was not an Israelite, who was not a Jew, was the one who treated that man who fell among thieves in the best possible way. Do you know even unbelievers at times treat other people better? Even some people get better treatment in a booker than they get in church. Do you know when you go to a booker, every day you come, ah, customer, you're welcome. But in church, the only people we welcome are first timers. Wave your hand, let's pray. Let's pray for you. God will touch you. When they come tomorrow, do you touch them again? Do you remember them? 
And people are dying of care, lack of care. People want significance. People want relevance. People want to be appreciated. Some wives are dying from lack of commendation from the husband. Ah, oh, my wife. Even if my wife brushes her teeth, I say those teeth are beautiful. Beautiful. Look at how set your teeth is at this age. Wow. Wow. When she finished, I said, don't go until I see you. <laughs> but some of our wives will just say, Why are you going like this? Why is she not going like that? She's beautiful. The dresses hug her body. Come and see assets. Hey! When I, when I, when I saw Sister Ibem this morning, I, I didn't want to lose the anointing, I would have shouted. That man, God, look at how you look delicious. <laughs> don't mind, Pastor. He said, I was a man, don't mind anymore. <laughs> when my wife walks, I said, That stepping is okay, okay. Let, let's improve it. You can I improve that stepping, my dear. Because you see, you are the only one I have. So instead of walking like a bag of rice, <laughs> I said, There's something called stepping. <laughs> Can't walk. Look at your neighbor and say, you are good looking, my dear. That is what people need to be told. People are that craving attention. When you see them dress well, commend them. Whatever. People are, lo they long for that. And there are women who are dying for their husband to say, wow. Wow. How we should not treat people. Let me just quickly rush through that. How not to treat people, number one, don't people put just as you feel. Don't treat them the way you feel. You feel nasty, you treat them nastily. Jesus never did that. When he was on the cross in pain, Luke 23, verse 34, he said, Father, forgive them. He didn't say, thunder fire you. <laughs> I saw a man of God cursing people on the program. I said, you see, did Jesus ever do that? Did he ever say, raka? Don't treat people the way you feel. When Stephen was being stoned, and he was calling upon God, the people that were studying him gathered their clothes together at the feet of a man known as Saul of Tarsus at 760. And uh, Stephen was praying, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Don't treat people the way you feel. You feel unhappy, that should not determine the way you feel. People Treat people. There is grace to override that. You feel nasty, you feel disappointed, you feel heartbroken, don't do that. Hold yourself back and say, God, give me grace. Give me grace. Don't treat people the way you feel. You won't feel okay all the time. But people need to be appreciated all the time. People need to be loved all the time. Number two, don't treat people as other people treat them. The way others people treat someone should not determine the way you treat them. What others don't know, you know. You know Jesus. You have his example. You have his instruction. Don't treat people the way others treat them. Jesus came to his own people. They did not receive him, but you and I received him. And to as many they received them, him, he gave you power. Don't treat people the way others treat them. Because others can treat them anyhow. They don't know who they are. They don't have the knowledge you have. That a show should be with that knowledge is not good. You know the right thing to do. Don't treat people the way others treat them. Don't treat people the way others treat them. Others could look down on them. Don't look down on them. When others are cast, or say there is a casting, you say there is a lifting. Believe in them if even their parents don't believe in them. Believe in them if their colleagues don't believe in them. 
Don't treat people the way others treat them. Number three, don't treat others as you are told to treat them. People will tell you, especially wives will tell their husband, you see that boy, don't look. Don't allow him, no grief for him. Don't treat people the way others tell you. Where I come from, there's another that says, whoever is told to do something and does it, it's not because of who told you to do it, it's because of the kind of person you are. Don't let others tell you the way to treat people. No. Others will tell you, don't listen to him. Pastor, don't listen to him. My husband, don't listen to him. My wife, don't listen to that boy. Yo. That boy don't listen to that boy. Yo. I will listen to Jesus. Others are not the one to tell me how to treat somebody. It's Jesus who tells me how to do something. I follow Jesus' instruction, not the instruction of others. The way people treat people will not determine the way I treat them. There are people you don't like, not because you know their lifestyle, but because of something somebody told you about them. I refuse to treat people the way others tell me to treat them. Why? Because the other that I will listen to is Jesus Christ. Don't treat, the way, don't treat people the way others tell you to treat them. But listen to the Lord, how he leads you as to how you treat people. I've been a minister, and there are some people my wife don't like in church. But you know what? She knows. If you give me cancer, I will only listen if it agrees with God. It agrees with God. The counsel of the Lord shall stand and shall endure to all generations. You don't know what people are going through. There was a woman in our church when I was pastoring, and my wife would tell me, oh, look, that woman, that woman, that. She kept telling me about that woman. So even I didn't, I didn't listen to the woman for a while. So one day I said, come, sit down. By the time the woman finished telling me her situation and circumstances, I told her, I said, you know what? I wanted to follow me home. When she entered the house, my wife, suddenly she was in combative mode. I said, sit down. I said, the story you told me about yourself and what you've been going through. Tell my wife. She never said more than half of what she said. My wife stood up and hugged her. I said, oh, no, don't hug her. Don't hug her. Why are you hugging her? I said, can't you hear? My wife was even crying more than she. I said, you see that? You see people's faces, you don't know their story. We judge people too much. And Bible says, judge not so that you don't be judged. We be careful. Don't run quickly to conclude. Don't treat people the way you are told to treat them. Number four, don't treat people based on what you have heard alone, which you have never verified. You can hear things about people, but verify. That's why the Bible says, prove all things. As a young minister, there were some pastors I didn't want to have anything to do with because of what others told me that I did not verify. Many occasions after I verified them and I got close to these people, I had to apologize to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Don't treat people based on what you hear. Hearsay is either plus one or minus one. Test every spirit. Even if they are that bad, don't you, need, don't you think they need mercy? They need mercy, not judgment. Mercy, there was grace, and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There, look, I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, I came to Christ from a very terrible background. I came to Christ from a wretched family. My father was a serial monogamist. My father married six different women at various times. So there's nothing about my background. But everything in my background put my back to the ground. There was nothing attractive about my family background. We had 13 children from six women. 
My father will marry one, he will have two or three children, we go away, we'll take another one, marry that one for three months, drop one and carry one in pregnancy. When that one is born, he'll return the one. So we are 12 of us from a motley of women. My family, we started us as Muslims. No, we started as idol worshippers. And then we became Muslims. And then we became members of the Methodist Church. Because my father, as a Muslim, was interpreting for the Methodist Church missionaries. So at the point in time, they said, we can't keep you on payroll if you don't get baptized as a Methodist. So my father said, why not? <laughs> and so he got baptized. And later on, we got born again. I never knew a day of peace or a day of peace. Everything starts good. At the end, it's all over the places. I know that if anybody can stand, if God will mark iniquity, who will stand? I know what I came out from. There was no form of calling about me when God called me into the ministry. The day I got saved, the shirt I was wearing, the tie I was wearing, the coat I was wearing, the shoes I was wearing, the socks I was wearing, we all borrowed. A day before I drank 13 bottles of Odeku, Guinness. Several times before then I would have died from a drunken stupor. Overdose of drugs. But what kept me? You see my glory, you don't know my story. When I tell you that I will put my leg against the wall in my bedroom in Illinois, and I will go to France, I will go to Switzerland, I will go to Peru, Lima, I will go all over the places as a fully occultic person. But God brought me out of the horrible pit of Mary Claire and set my feet on the rock to stay and established my going and put a song in my mouth. You never know what that person can become. Will you be the one to abort it? By the way you treat them, will you draw them close to Christ or push them away from Christ? Don't ever. Listen, when I was in university, whenever I sit down like this in class, people who sit there, I mean, they, they run away. Because I was radiating demons. Apart from the, when I go to church in those days, just I go to church twice, December 31st, January 1st. By the time when people sit near me, the order, because I don't take my bath for one month. People, nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. But God gave me a chance. He brought me out of the world place. He cleansed me. He washed me with the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. No one qualifies to be treated the way Jesus treated you, but he did nonetheless. Will you not be the one who is going to separate and treat other people with despite? Will you not be the one who would want to do that? This church must be a church where we accept people. Come as you are, you will not go the way you are. We accept you the way you are. One day, one of our sisters, um, one, one, one girl came to church with bomb shots, small like this. And some police women in the body of Christ were standing at the door. So they came and told me, I said, some dickens are standing at the door. I said, the Bible did not say dickens will stand at the door. Jesus is the one who stands at the door. He said, behold, I stand at the door. So leave. Jesus said, I'm the door. Leave. This girl wore bomb shots to church. Came and sat in a conspicuous position. Preached the word like a house set on fire. She answered the altar call in bomb shot. She went back the next day. She came with another bomb shot. The next Sunday, another bomb shot. A whole cleavage was showing. I always tell people, the problem is not the person who dressed like that. The problem is your body that is not under. After about two weeks, she came in a skirt. After about four weeks, she came in a trouser. After about eight weeks, she started dressing normally. So I called her and said, I noticed that your dress is... He said, when I came down, those were the only shirts I have. That was the only clothes I have. He said, people would have looked at me and thought that I was trying to seduce people. He said, I've wasted all my life. And that was all I had. He said, since I came the first time, this woman here... She came to my house, she gave me towel, she gave me coverlet, she gave me, she came to my house, she saw I was sick, sleeping on the mat. That is how to treat people. She put food on my table. She told me that my life, if you see that girl now, the anointing which she, she preaches, you will never know. If we had treated her wrongly, that would have been a life that would have been lost for the kingdom of God. Don't treat people based on what you hear. 
What you hear is plus one or minus one. Let me give you a few more here. Don't treat people as enemies. Don't treat people as enemies. Jesus never said Peter, I mean Paul, I mean, never said Judas was an enemy. He said, my friend. Joseph never called his senior brothers who sold him to slavery his enemies. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Don't treat anybody as your enemy. There's only one enemy you have. You know who that is? Satan. If people who are your enemies today realize they are doing the wrong thing, they will stop. God to Abraham, Genesis 12, 1. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make of you a great nation. And thou shall be a blessing. Then he says, and I will bless them that bless you and cause him reduction. Those who bless you will increase. Those who cause you will reduce. Don't treat people as enemies. My enemies have helped me more than they think they can. Joseph's enemies helped him. Daniel, Shadrach, Misha, Abednego, the enemies of Israel, came and captured these boys, took them to Babylon, and that was what brought about their elevation. Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good for them who love God, who are they called according to your purpose, his purpose. God knows how to make things work out for your good. Don't treat anybody as your enemy. God says, vengeance is mine. I will recompense. Nobody's your enemy. Nobody's your enemy. He said, leave them to me. Psalm 68, verse 1. Oh God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Oh God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Manifest yourself. First Peter 3, 9. Don't offer railing for railing, cursing for cursing, but contrary words of blessing, knowing that you have been called to inherit your blessing. Anybody who is fighting you is fighting God. We need not to treat people as enemies. Let me say this. You see, most of the time when you see people who are killing their enemies, you know what you do when you kill your enemy? You multiply it. Because a grain of wheat will abide only except it fall into the ground and die. And when it dies, what does it do? It multiplies. That's why arrows are always coming. I don't know of any enemy that I have. Oh, have I not done things that were, oh, yes, I did. When we were in the occult, let me tell you this. One of the things we make Christians conscious about is that there's an invisible war against them, which is not real. You fight shadows. You fight shadows. A lot of prayer. And they are flying. I don't know of any enemy. When I was in the occult, I have been someone who, listen, even when I went against Christians, it never worked. For the real Christian though, because if they dwell in the secret place of the Most High, they are by all the shadows of the Almighty. Your lack of living right exposed you. So even when the devil is passing by, one woman came to me for 10 minutes and said, the devil did this, the devil did. I had the devil say to me, they would say, most of the things he's saying, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> most of us say, I'm not aware of it. But when you live in sin, living in sin puts you in the direct path of the enemy. Exodus 23, 22, he said, I will be an enemy to your enemy and an adversary to your adversary. Why fight when God said he will fight for you? I don't waste my energy to fight. The devil, one day I wanted to sleep, and the devil said to me, you will die tomorrow. I said, okay, let's see what will happen. Do you think the devil will tell you when you're going to die? So when I slept and I woke up, I said, devil, devil where are you? You sure we die? I, I, the Bible said, I let me die asleep, and I wake, for the Lord sustained me. I said, you said I would die, but you see, I will not die, but leave. Because there's a lot of work to be done. Look at your enemy and say, you will not die. Say, this year, you will not die. Say, this year, you will not die. Say, you will not die, but leave. Let me give you two more. How many have I given you? Your money has actually expired. Five. Listen to this. Don't treat people the way the thieves treated that man. 
What did they do? They took what he had. They used him and they dumped him. Using people and dumping them is a cruel thing. Don't have anything to do with that. They may no longer be serving the purpose they served before, but they still have other purposes. He said, old man shall dream dreams. In our ministry, we don't retire old people. We refire them. In old age, Psalm 92 verse 14, you shall be fat and flourishing. We treat them well. People who have lived in the service of God with all their heart, the worry head is good if it's got in the way of righteousness. They serve God, they live for God. Then when they get to an age, because their strength failed them, Psalm 71 verse 9 says, do not abandon me when my strength fail me. God does not abandon all people. He doesn't. Isaiah 46 verse 4, he said, in old age, I have, I, he said, I created you, I will be with you, I will carry you even to your old age. Who abandon you? I won't forsake you. I love old people. They have what young people don't have. Young people have strength. Old people, wisdom. They have seen many things. They say, this thing you are saying, it's going work. Oh. But you say, hey, it's going work. Huh? Oh, yeah. If you don't learn it theoretically, you learn it practically. Don't treat people as enemies. Don't treat people like that. Treat them the way Jesus treated them. Treated them with dignity. Even the Pharisees are the Sadducees. When I see some ministers cursing out their, 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 their president or general of I say, where, where are you from? You have not learned from Christ. Christ never treated people like that. He said, all men shall dream dreams. If they cannot see vision again, they will at least dream. Why? Because they are sleeping. You don't dream if you don't sleep. In our church, you see old men in front who have been in our church for 30 something years sleeping throughout the service. I tell you, I said, don't wake them up. It's better to sleep in God's presence than to sleep at home. I know some people who come to church just to sleep inside the air conditioner because they don't have generator at home to power the, the fan. I even know people who come to our church to go to the toilet. Let us be careful the way we treat people. Let us not treat them the way the thieves treated the man. Use and dump. Some men will use a girl and dump her and marry someone else. You will soon meet Margot and the one you marry. Oh, you think you can use me and run away? Some people use pastor to get paper. After paper come. Now, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. The Holy Spirit did not speak before paper came up. Use and drop is coming in the body of Christ. After you've had your fear, that's why there are so many senior sisters in church. Some brothers along the line wasted their time. You know what I'm saying? You don't go marry them now. Why are you going to hold on? That's why in our church, any courtship beyond two years is dissolved automatically. Don't waste our sister's time. Because all of a sudden, you now see somebody. You didn't see vision before. Now you are seeing vision. Say, actually, the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the Holy Spirit. I know what is dealing with you. You don't see finish. You don't chop, clean mouth. We go remove your teeth. One more point here. I know there are about 10 of them. But do not also treat others like the religious leaders did. The, the Levites and the priests, look at the way they treated that man. They treated that person as a problem to be avoided. Don't treat anybody as a problem to be avoided. You may not be able to solve all their problems, the one you can solve. May the Lord give you strength to solve them. You may not be able to do so much. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 42, give to him that asketh you, and to him that cometh to borrow from you, don't turn away. You know, today we are going to sign a covenant in this church. And that is a covenant of treating each other well. You are my brother, you are my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will walk till he comes.
comes, there is no foe that can. How many of you know that song? I'm walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will. After this service, we are going to go around. We are going to hug some hands and hug some people and just look them in the face and say, I love you. I will not hurt you. I need you to survive. You know that song by his guy, Walker? You are important to me. I need you to. You pray for me. I pray for you. We are. I need you survive you hurt you with what from my mouth I love I need you to survive you are that every need be supplied you are That was the spirit in which I was born again as a Christian. One body, one body, one Lord, one faith, one people, one nation. Oh, pray. We are heads of the fire. Oh, we are joined. We are children of the kingdom. We are family. We are. I'm gonna you know this song. I love this family of God. Let's sing it. So close. service is that you're going to go around. It's people you have not been talking to, you are looking to look at them and say, you are important to me. You pray for me, I pray for you. We are part of God's own family. You are important to me. I need you to Listen to me. Pastor and your wife, please stand up here, come up here. I want you to love these people.